Good afternoon to you, to you if you are in London or in Europe, and good evening to you if you are in Singapore or Asia. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. I'm delighted that we are now finally having this book launch for Professor Gang Wu Wang. Some of you may know that there is an event that we had planned earlier in the year. First of all, I think in February, and that had to be deferred when there was a nationwide strike at British universities. And then the event was rescheduled for March, end of March. And that happens to be the beginning of the lockdown in the UK. And therefore, again, we have to defer. So I'm really, really pleased that we finally can hold this online book launch for a distinguished alumni of SOAS, Professor Wang Gangwu, who is also a senior fellow at SOAS. Um, the format of this event is that we will have it for an hour or together. I will make introductions to the book as I understand it, and Professor Wang will respond. Uh, this should take us about 20 or a bit over 20 minutes, and then it will allow us over 30 minutes of time for uh, Q&A. And if you would like to raise a question, uh, please use the Q&A box for that. And if you are watching this via the live feed on um, Facebook, if you could also send in your questions, our colleague will put that into the uh, Q&A box so that Professor Wang and I can see the questions and we will address them. Let me start by uh, talking about this absolutely fantastic book. To me, reading this book is a great joy. It is both a macro history. It is also a personal history in some ways. It's a macro history because this is something which really look at the widespread and uh, deep roots of Chinese history and bringing that, bringing that to bear in helping us to understand China and its relationship with the rest of the world today. And it is personal because Professor Wang has shared some of his personal experience and his development from the time when he went to China as an undergraduate in 1948, where he would stay for a year before the Chinese Civil War uh, meant that he had to leave China and complete his education back in uh, British Malaya as it still then was. And by interwoving the two, it is an extraordinarily difficult job to, to do. I think he has carried it off fantastically well because of his deep knowledge, both of classical Chinese history and of his contemporary history, society, and people. And by combining this with his personal experience, I think we get a kind of perspective that we normally do not find in excellent history books of China or other contemporary uh, books on China. I can't believe that there is anybody among our colleagues who is in a sense better suited to deliver this. Um, as many of you will know, Professor Wang is a very distinguished historian with very, very uh, long record in explaining in detail and in the most eloquent way China's history, culture, and civilization. He's also somebody who, as a scholar, knows the history of Southeast Asia and the Mediterranean terribly well. So for somebody who is trying to fit Chinese history into the global context, uh, very, very few people are able to do that. 
And I would say that Professor Wang Gongwu is one of the very few who can, and he's done that extremely well. Now, what I'm going to say next are entirely my personal take. It is not going to be a summary of the book. Uh, Professor Wang is here with us and he can speak much more eloquently about his book in the second part of this book launch in response to your questions or queries or comments. By looking at this big picture of how to relate how China's past connects with China's present and how China's uh, relationship with itself connects with the rest of the world. I think this book also raises to me the question of what is China and how should we understand China's history and how its history affects the behavior of China as a country today. As a liberal scholar, I think Professor Wang does not really prescribe, but he offers and share with us a view on how China can be understood. And he offer his understanding of it. And in so doing, he raised a lot of very interesting and important questions. One thing that jumps to me is when we talk about China, what do we mean when we talk about Chinese history? Where do we use as the benchmark? Now, this book will address this kind of issues. For most people looking at China, the pre-Republican benchmark was the last imperial dynasty, the Qing. Well, the Qing dynasty was also the Manchu dynasty, as the Chinese would call it. But we can also have called the Qing period as a Manchu conquest of China. The Manchu empire was an empire. How do we see that? I think is an important matter. Or do we go back to China as it was being defined by the first and the second empire, the Qin and the Han dynasties? If we look at China by the benchmarking of the Qin and the Han, then we are looking at what we would today call perhaps China proper and excluding about a third of the country which will really become integral part of what we now call China under the imperial Qing dynasty. Which ben benchmarks to make? I think will affect how we want how we will look at China today as to what it is. Is it a multinational uh, national state, or is it in fact still a kind of an empire, albeit without an emperor? That difference, I think, is important, and there is. I don't think a definitive way that is correct or wrong. It simply is a different way of how we can look at China. And these are the kind of issues which I think have been raised as I read the book. And I found that really important and relevant for us to understand that. And given Professor Wang's focus on macro history, I think we can see that China's approach to its modernization domestically and its place in the world is being seen through the prism of China's long history. And I, by my own training, is first and foremost a political scientist, even though I have also dabbled into history. Um, but primarily looking at it as, as from the perspective of a um, political scientist, I very much admire and respect that broad historical sweep with which Professor Wang looked at the issue. But as it does so, I think there is potentially a possibility that the 
way how the Chinese government is conducting itself is being put on a more positive gloss in, in, in terms of how it matches the general big patterns of how China behave in history. And we might have not looked so much into the specifics and the details of the nature of the political system. It's a bit like when we are looking at, at a particular tree and a big forest, focusing more on the forest might uh, result in us not paying so much attention to the details of the tree. Now, does it matter? Does it not matter? Does the fact that we are dealing with a Leninist party state from Mao through Deng Xiaoping, through Zhang Jimin, through Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping really still present a China that is in the tradition of Confucian China, are we still really looking at a revival of a Confucian China, albeit, of course, a modernized version of it? And I got a sense that the book is saying that, yes, more or less generally in big picture terms, that is it for uh, notwithstanding that there are issues there. To me, looking at the same issue, rereading the book, something that hit me was that if we look at what Confucian China in a modernized 21st century might look like, what we see on mainland China clearly presents a credible uh, manifestation. But there is another equally credible, and to me in some ways, even more credible uh, manifestations, and that is Taiwan. Now, this is not going to be very popular with a lot of people in Taiwan who prefers to see Taiwan simply as a separate uh, identity. I respect that. I, I am not going to take issue with that. I'm looking at it purely from the perspective of a scholar and not getting involved in the politics of it. And to me, with my limited understanding of Chinese history and civilization and Confucianism, if we reduce Confucians, Confucius teachings to his bare minimum, the most important teaching the Grand Master left is that we must do the right thing in the judgment of history, so not in the judgment of the prince or the king emperor not in the judgment of the uh, scholar serving the king emperor at a particular time. It is to be judged in history and do the right thing. It, in some ways, is very vague. What is the right thing to do? Now, if we go back to Confucius' own teaching, obviously, in his day and age, he did not know what democracy mean. But would he have objected to democratization, democracy, respecting rights of individuals and respecting a common playbook that all must abide by, prince or pauper? My reading is that Confucius would have very much approved of that because that is, if you like, on the right side of history. And that's what we have seen in Taiwan. And that's why I would say that if we're looking at a modern manifestation of a Confucian China, Taiwan provides a very, very credible uh, picture of what it would look like. It doesn't have to look like what we see on mainland China, where you have a, a party state where it remains very top down and um, with the rights of individuals being uh, considered secondary to the interest of the modern version of the princess. So I think this is something that I would certainly like to put to Professor Wang to see whether he might like to um, respond to see how by looking at the big picture whether it does or doesn't actually matter in terms of how we see the uh, specific nature of the current political uh, 
uh, system in place. And I wanted to end here by just saying how much I have enjoyed the book. I think it is a genuinely thought provoking and eye opening book on how we should understand China and its history. And by understanding China and its history and use that as a benchmark to understand China today, we may well understand the country and its relationship with the rest of the world much better. And in so doing, I think Professor Wang has done us an enormous service. I would recommend this book wholeheartedly. And I think we, anyone who prefers not to read it, probably has something to lose. And those who read it will, have, will find it highly rewarding. I'll stop here and hand over to you, Gang Wu, for your responses. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, you've been uh, extremely generous in your uh, assessment of what you what you've read, and uh, indeed, I I have taken a taking a big picture, and big pictures of what uh, have their limits. They are really efforts to understand something which has a long history. If it's something of a shorter history, it may not be so important. But when we know definitely the Chinese people have this long history and they talk so much about it and history is so important in many in the lives of many of their scholars and intellectuals as well as their political leaders, then we have to take that into account. Let me say that I would like to begin by distinguishing between a country with a set of a, a people, a civilization, a culture with a set of very high ideals and about how to be good, how to build a happy and harmonious society, all those high ideals, the moral values, the kind of tolerance and the freedom that uh, every human being would value. That's a set of ideals. But there's another side of it, side of it. A, a country that has lasted so long cannot just depend on the ideals. It's based on a political structure of a powerful state which has got both wealth as well as military power to defend itself against potential enemies or to have the wealth to sustain its uh, civilization at a very high standard and so on. So what, they, what China did was when China appeared on the scene as China, I think it was when it was united, as you say, under the Qin and Han dynasties. That was when it became China. Before that, it was China culturally and in, in many other structural ways, but very different. But when it became a uni unified state, it acquired certain other characteristics, which are nothing to do with Confucius. It's a structure which is based on the military, on the economy, on centralized bureauc bureaucratic power, and the sense of united purpose to survive, to thrive, if necessary, to expand, and if not to expand, at least to have the capacity to defend itself against all comers. That is a state structure. It is a system of government and the Qin Han state, both the Qin and the Han, the Qin set up a highly centralized bureaucratic state with very strong legal structures, which are extremely tough and very rough justice offered but, and very demanding. That is to, in order to preserve the power of the state. And they were very, very rough, rough to the, all those Confucians and other scholars who were offering different ideas. When the Qin fell and the Han Dynasty took over, they of course learned from it and cut down on the mistakes the Qin made and brought in the Confucians to soften the image of that state. But the structure of the state as a legalist, realist state remain. But now, as it were, a very powerful fist wrapped up with Confucian rhetoric to soften it, to make it more acceptable, to, as it were, to provide the softness of the power that lies within. That balance of hard core of 
power and wealth with a soft image of uh, concern and caring and welfare oriented sense of uh, respect of, for people and so on, remained a tension all that time. And in that context, it survived many, many blows. After all, that state that the Han Dynasty had set up lasted for nearly 400 years, was destroyed, basically destroyed by invasion after invasion. Uh, the invasions that destroyed the, the, uh, the Qin, for example, and divided the country into two. The reunification under the Tang. In a way, this had nothing to do with who, whether you are Chinese or not Chinese. Whoever controlled this machinery of the state provided the structure of what we call China. And I think that this is what I mean by China. China is that reality of something that is powerful, highly organized, legalistic in a very narrow way, everything structured to preserve the power of the, of the ruler. In this case, the emperor, but it doesn't have to be an emperor, it could be some other form. So it doesn't matter whether it's a Chinese emperor, a Manchu, a Kitan, a Jurchen, or, or a Mongol, whoever took over the state, or in fact, brought in their own ideas of the state to reinforce, in fact, make it even stronger as the Mongols did, and so did the Manchus in their own way, actually made that state that the Qin Han had created even stronger. So let me go back to my own education. The most Chinese were brought up to believe that idea of China stems from the classics, the Qing, the classics of the Confucians, as well as other thinkers, but in particular Confucius and Mencius, that these values represented the core of Chinese thinking, Chinese civilized uh, life, and the values which the Chinese value. I think that's, that is perfectly correct. But actually, the state had, was using that. The state was not based on that. The state was based on military power, economic wealth, and a tremendous capacity to use that wealth to stay in power. And that was created by the Qin and the Han. And that survived despite many, many attempts to destroy it by invaders, because the invaders themselves found that it was very useful to keep that structure. They kept it going. So what does this mean? It means that over the last 2000 years, when the Chinese built up a whole body of knowledge, they allowed the Confucians to determine the shape of that knowledge. So the Confucians put the classics at the top. These are the ideals, the sort of high ideals that everyone should have. But the reality was something else. The reality was the survival of a unified state. Always the ideal is to unify the state because when it's divided, it's weakened. And when it's weakened, invasions take advantage and will, will come and try and destroy the state. So in order to survive, after the 2000 years, the one major lesson that was learned by the state is that it must always be a unified state under central power in order to survive. And this is preserved, not in the Qing. The Qing talks about all sorts of high ideals, but in the Shi, the 2000 years of history, History is not our, what we mean by history. History is a whole set of records that preserve the system to show how the system has been protected, saved, strengthened, endorsed, re-endorsed again and again by being strong and unified. So the, it, it is a shi, which we, we call it the 24 histories from uh, Shiji to, to Ming Dynasty, and then there's the Qing history. So when I talk about China reconnects, I emphasize the connecting the past to the, to the present, the new world history. And my stress is upon the fact that they have reconnected with that shi, with that 2000 years of continuity based on a centralized state with all the manifestations of wealth and power. And that has kept it going and it may enable it to fall again and again and rise again and again. Yeah, after every fall, it will rise the next time even stronger. And this is true. The Tang Dynasty in many ways was stronger than the Han. And then the Mongols, after the Mongols, the Ming and the Manchus, much stronger than the earlier dynasties. And today, what has happened, I think, which is very interesting, the Chinese have learned a few things more. 
They've learned about science, they've learned about all the ideas, other people's political institutions, they learn about the economy, the capitalist economy, about manufacturing, industrial manufacturing. They've learned all the science and technology that can be learned. And the Chinese have no problems learning that at all. And what they've done is that they've reconstructed the state, which is based on the idea of progress, something that the Chinese never understood before. In fact, the idea of progress is the one really revolutionary idea that was brought to China after the 19th century. Before that, the Chinese always looked to some golden age which is all highly idealistic. But thereafter, and you can see this in the whole of the 20th century, I do not know of any Chinese intellectual who did not believe in some way that progress is possible, that China can be better, will be better, should be better than it used to be. And this idea of progress, where did they get that from? They got it from the West. But the West, of course, has some hesitations about it. But the person who symbolized the most complete faith in progress was Karl Marx. I'm not talking about communism. I don't think the Chinese understand that or care about that. They don't believe really in communism at all. But what, do, what they do now believe is that China can be better. There can be progress. And the progress can come from science and technology and all the other economic and financial and other uh, industrial uh, uh, advances that uh, have been made by the West, which they can learn. And they want to make sure that this will be the progress that they will build on in China and enable China to move on to the next stage of development. And I think this is what I meant by reconnecting. They're reconnecting with the state system that has survived for 2000 years with a lot of soft ideas. And so they do, want, do not want to discard the soft ideas. They know that the soft rhetoric that Confucius and his, and his disciples provided down to the Song Dynasty and beyond, all these idealists are very good for the state. They make the state uh, 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 more acceptable to people, make the state more human, make people more willing to serve it and be loyal to it. Because to talk about military power, to show it all the time is a great mistake. And they, they, they try to not to do it. And it's when you're really connected, you find all the Chinese state, when they, when they write about themselves and what they want to do, it sounds tremendous. The rhetoric is beautiful. But of course, behind it all, there's always been a strong structure of the system. So what I would like to say is that what we're looking at is after 100 years of two revolutions, three revolutions, if you include the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese have come out of it all. They know one thing, the past Confucian state is out. They don't want that, it's not enough. We now need a modern state. The modern state has been built by, first of all, the, the Kuomintang nationalists started it didn't finish the job. The Mao Zedong tried to continue, did a bad job in many ways, didn't quite, didn't quite integrate it into something that worked. Whereas since Deng Xiaoping's reforms, they've somehow managed to bring the whole thing together in a very forceful, and at the moment anyway, very, very encouraging and hopeful way. And the people are tremendously inspired, energized to believe that the future is now in their hands because they've mastered the instruments of the modernity and the kind of progress, of the ideal progress that they can achieve. Exactly where that progress will lead them to, I don't think they know. It doesn't matter as long as they're making progress and not turning back to the past. I think that is established. Now that is not Confucian. That is more like Marx than Confucius. So when I talk about, the, the go back to the Qing, when they, they overthrew the, the, the Manchu dynasty and did they go back to Confucian state? No, they rejected it altogether. They tried nationalism, they tried liberalism, capitalism from the West. They didn't succeed, they lost out to the communists. The communist party brought in new ideas from Marx, Lenin and so on. But what they really succeeded in doing was not to get the ideas across to the people. I don't think the people care very much about what Lenin said or what Stalin said. That's not the point. What they've achieved, however, is they've reconstructed the state. They've restructured it in such a way that it actually bears some resemblance to the continuity of the past, offering the kind of wealth and power and centralized authority that would enable the country to stay unified, and if unified, can remain safe, secure from now onwards, and then and make the progress which enable the standards of living to rise, for people to get wealthier and generally happier. This is, the, this is their idea. 
So if you can see why, why I say that they now have two sages instead of one. They have one stage, which sage which still says Confucius, but it's got nothing to do with Confucius really. It is simply to say, this is to, that we, we recognize our continuity with the past. Confucius symbolizes that. And it gives you the soft picture, the softer image of China, which they don't, they, they really like because that's, that makes them look very much better, makes them really feel that they are being human, caring, and really concerned for people. Whereas the other side of it, the state, the nature of the state, that it should be powerful and centralized must be secured. And they're secured in order to get a better future because they believe in progress. And how to make, how to symbolize the sage for the progress, for progress, they put Marx there. Again, I don't think they care very much about what Marx's philosophy was or where and where it really is linked to Stalin or Lenin, nothing like that at all. What they're concerned about is that they need a, a, a picture of the progress to go forward, that you have something to go to do to, to become better. At the same time, they've learned that they must connect with the past. If they lose that, then they will lose their sense of security. If they have to take up everything from the West and become an imitation Europe or imitation West, it will not be Chinese anymore. So there's that element as well. So this mixture of a sense of pride in themselves, having this heritage of wealth and power, which they like to restore because it can it will be an asset clear idea of it that it can be restored and there is progress ahead has I think made them reconnect with the past. In that context, it's not ideology that counts today. It may sound like ideology, whether it's Confucian or Marxist, it may sound like that, that's all words. What really matters is that they have a system and they want to make, they want to make this system work. Whether Xi Jinping can or not and how long he can make it work, I do not know. And of what the final form will be like, I do not know. But what I do know is that they will always aim to be uh, to make China unified, all of China, doesn't matter. And the borders didn't matter. They never had proper borders anyway. They've now, now they've been given borders. These are new features, all right? They accept it. They accept the international borders that the, the world is recognized. If you, that is the border. And everything within that border is China. But, and, and, and the China concept is nothing to do with the borders. The China concept is that whatever they have, they must keep unified and defend it with all means possible. And that part of it requires a system that is defensible, that can be reinforced from time to time and be continually ensure the safety of the system. That must be, as it were, self-generating capacity to secure itself and make itself even more powerful and more uh, secure in the future. I think I put it quite simply like that, very bluntly. In fact, I'm venturing into your sphere of political science, Steve. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gang Wu. That's really fantastic. Um, let me just remind all our participants that if you would like to raise a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box at the right hand bottom of the screen, um, both Gang Wu and I should be able to pick up the questions and we will uh, address them as they come. Um, while we are waiting to see whether there are questions and comments from the uh, participants, let me do two things. One is to uh, remind you that this is a book launch which is supported generously by the publisher, uh, Well Scientific. I think they are offering a discount to um, participants who would like to purchase the books afterwards. And so you will find the details in the chat box. You will also find, I think, a discount code on the website of the uh, Source China Institute, and we should be able to um, you should be able to get that details. In the meantime, I think there was a question from Professor uh, Sean Paul Leconte. It says the public opinion is more and more worried about climate change and environmental issues how the environmental dimensions 
should be dealt with in Belt and Road projects in, in a manner that the world would serve China and the wider world's long-term interest. Um, over to you, uh, Gang Wu, for that question. Uh, it's in the chat box. Question. I, I think it's, uh, this is what, an example of kind of the new ideas and a new phenomenon that the Chinese are learning to cope with. They never had this problem as a really serious one because they were never industrialized. They never needed to use the kind of uh, energy sources that uh, now are polluting the air and creating all the climate change problems that we now face. So they never had that problem before, although they were very quite sensitive about nature. I mean, I, and the, the whole body of knowledge can come from the Taoists, for example, uh, to place a tremendous emphasis on nature. And you see where all the temples are built all over the place. You can see how much these uh, thinking people and love to be uh, in, in, a, in a more natural context. So they never had that as a real problem, but today, at the speed that they were developing economically for the last 50 years, they have a serious problem. They have problems, serious problems of water shortage, of, of uh, clean water, of reliability, of uh, uh, how to control the weather, how to, how to deal with the kind of things that the industrialization has created, not only for themselves, not for, for the rest of the world, but it's uh, the fact that by polluting it so much, that it joins the rest of the world in polluting the whole world is now clear to them that it affects them. It is not a question of how it hurts other people, it doesn't affect us, it affects them very directly. And the kind of costs that are, the people of China are paying for some of the speed at which they industrialize is now becoming more obvious. And I think the, the government actually has been realizing that for the last 20 years or so, they have begun to do various things at, at the local level. I'm quite impressed actually, by the amount of uh, effort and the consciousness that has been built up among the ordinary Chinese people about the need to take care of the environment in order that they themselves can live to be healthy and, and have a decent life. I think this is now definitely rising. How, it, how to do it so that the rest of the world can also benefit, I'm not sure that is, that is a much more difficult message. But I think the fact that they're doing it for themselves, even just to protect their own interests, that will help the world a lot. Thank you. We have quite a few other questions um, in the Q&A box. Let me first relate to the questions about, so is history guiding the present state authorities or is the present state authority simply using history to justify their policy? I would say that they were not using it to justify their policy. They're learning from history to make their policy possible. In fact, their policies are learning from how previous dynasties, how the previous states all through that time, how they dealt with every challenge, how they, they use their institutional strength to cope with the kind of challenges they face, whether it was an enemy from outside, big floods, locusts, natural disasters that killed millions of people. How did they respond? All that is actually recorded in the volumes and volumes of historical records, They're actually great details about how everybody responded in different periods of time, learned how to improve their methods of dealing with the disasters and challenges that uh, China had to face. And I think that is a tradition that they believe in. The state must be able and have the capacity to respond to challenges and to deal with them in one way or the other. And the institutional basis of that still lies in the fact that it must be authoritarian, centralized with efficient and incorrupt bureaucracy. Uh, that's something that they aimed at for a long time and never really succeeded. But it's something that they always aimed at. It is true, if you look through the whole of Chinese history, always the concern about corruption, nepotism, all these things, because it's real. And they never totally solved it and they will never solve it totally. But that they are conscious of it and they recognize that this remains a serious problem. In fact, it's a the, 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 the challenge is even greater because when you, if you're corrupt today, you can be corrupt far more than you have ever been corrupt before. And the kind of wealth that they created by the new industrial developments and so on, 
absolutely unbelievable by, by the standards of the past. People now have genuine wealth. They have genuine capacity to, in fact, not only invest in their own businesses, but to spread out around the world. They can actually do things which are unbelievable to their, and to their, among their ancestors. So this is a tremendously exciting and challenging thing for all these young Chinese that are growing up and being educated about the world today. So joining that path to the new world order is a really a new adventure for them. And they're tremendously in, in, inspired. And this is one of the reasons why, of course, it's frightening to other people. Other people see these tremendously enterprising and hardworking people, finding the means now to challenge them across the board. And this is really quite alarming to those who have been used to assuming that their power, the power of the, you might say, the, the, the Western Eurocentric worldview, so to speak, has had a fairly easy time for the last 200 years. They have never expected there to be a genuine challenge that could come in this way. And they don't like it, understandably, and they will try to stop it. And this is what I think is building up to a new tension today, that they see China as a threat, not because it's a threat to any particular country, but it's a threat because it's offering a completely different way of doing things, which seem to work, at least so far. And this is something that is unacceptable to those who are more accustomed to the kind of liberal traditions that you and I have grown up with. And in fact, we are, we have learned to appreciate. And we're not, that's why I'm not clear what will be the eventual uh, fate of all, all these developments. All I know is that the Chinese have acquired that confidence now that they know what they need to, to, to build up the China that they want, to, to continue the kind of success story that have made, they made China so, so successful over the last 2000 years. Thank you, Kang Wu. Next question from Richard. Could you draw a parallel between Xi Jinping and an emperor from antiquity? And if so, who would that be and why? Well, you see, I, I think Xi Jinping is not a man, not an emperor in that sense. What the emperor that I think has taken over from the emperors of the past in the emperor state, I used to call it the emperor state, now it's a party state. So from the stage of emperor state to the party state, it was a very difficult period of several revolutions. And I think they've now achieved, in fact, this was attempted by the Kuomintang too. The Kuomintang itself was a party state, just that it wasn't a successful one. The party state under Mao Zedong was also a party state. It was a little bit more successful, but in the end it failed. Now Deng Xiaoping has reconstructed the party state in a completely different way by taking advantage of all the new learning, the new capitalist methodologies, the financial systems of the, of the, of the liberal economic order, the market system, market economy of the world, and, and integrated into their own system. And what, what has done therefore is that they have now actually created something that they believe can work. Now, the party, if you want to have an example of an emperor, the party is the emperor. And Xi Jinping represented, yes, he's, he's one of many. He may want to be the emperor, but he's not an emperor. He's not the emperor. The party is the emperor. He is acting in the party's name. His capacity to control the party enables him to behave as if he were the emperor, but actual power rests with the party. And he is actually as much a servant of that party as, as, a, as its leader. Thank you, uh, Gang Wu. I'm going to combine three questions together next because I think they kind of are related to each other. It is about the idea of the unification of China as a state. Uh, one of them would like you to comment on what is the spend of this unification? It is all about China within the confined, defined territories of the PRC, or is it much wider? Does it even include perhaps Chinese overseas? And related to this is a question about how does the South China Sea fit into this Chinese world order? And also the question of how does China and in its views of its um, positioned uh, fit in in the whole general area of Southeast Asia? 
Oh, these are several different questions there. So let me, let me try and put it this way. The Chinese had never had a clear border. The, the, the idea of a sovereignty of uh, national borders, territorial borders, is a completely new idea. It, it's almost as new as, 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 as a powerful an idea like the idea of progress. They've never had that before. The idea of sovereignty has never really been developed by the Chinese. What they, what they, what they mean is that whatever area that is under their administration is China. And what has happened in the modern world, and this is part of things that they accept from the modern world, the modern world has created an international system of nation states. And by that international system, they've acknowledged the borders of China when it was created in 1911, 1912 as the Republic of China. Lots of people question that. The Russians try to take some part of the, the West, Northwest, Mongolia. The Japanese took Manchuria. The British looked at Tibet. All sorts of people try to narrow China down to China proper. But what happened was, this remarkable story really, was when the Sun Yat-sen passed on the presidency to Yuan Shikai. And Yuan Shikai got the Manchus to abdicate in his favor as president of China. He had the whole diplomatic world internationally, except that the Republic of China inherited the borders of Qing China. Now, whatever that means, but that is now sacred to the Chinese. It was recognized, internationally recognized. And to this day in 1945, when the war ended, the borders of the people, the, the Kuomintang, in fact, I don't think it was very really clearly drawn, lots of disputed areas, but it was the, the borders of more or less that of Qing China was accepted as the borders of Republic, the Republic of China. And including the borders in Turkestan, Mongolia, uh, Inner Mongolia, Tibet, uh, and Xinjiang. So all this was internationally accepted. And now they said, no, that is China. I mean, it's, it's not a question of continuity. The continuity is that that is China because that is recognized as a territorial area to be controlled by the government in Beijing. And now they're holding that to everybody's, uh, 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 whatever the intent was at the time. And now they, say, they call it sovereignty, this is territorial, and this is sacred now. Now, but this idea that these are fixed borders are totally new to them. They've learned this from the West. They've actually making use of international law to say, this is sovereign territory. You cannot intervene with whatever happens inside because every country actually insists on that anyway. So China is using that. As for the South China Sea, now this is of course very complicated. It's, on the one hand, we're talking about international law, which is nobody very clear about international law, about waters anyway. They're all very modern, they negotiated over the last few decades, and the Chinese never understood that. They understood territorial by land, even that over the century, they, that it was a movable, movable border, always been. You, you show me a map of China of any dynasty, which is exactly the same, never been the same. It moved back and forth, it doesn't matter. However much you can control, that was China. And now it has been internationally recognized border, that is China. And anybody who says no is challenging the sovereignty of China and is challenging something that the Chinese can't consider sacred. When it comes to water, I don't think they have, anybody has really any clear idea of what that really means. You cannot use land borders as an analogy. And as for international law, they argued about this in UNCLOS for a long time, but even in the UNCLOS, they left some, some things very unclear. They actually agreed that if there are sovereignty issues over, over, over islands or reefs or whatever, that is a matter for, the, for future discussion, doesn't come under UNCLOS directly. And there are dispute over territorial areas. There's still a lot of vagueness there. In my mind, I have talked to heard international lawyers talk about this. They recognize that. They're moving towards it. In fact, one of the reasons why this issue was brought to the court over the question of uh, the Philippines uh, uh, petition to the court, it was another step forward in the hope of trying to resolve what, what does it mean to have maritime borders? Not clear. Now, in that context, what the Chinese claim, of course, is not based on any international law. But whose claim is based on international law that is universally accepted? I mean, the Chinese don't accept that the Vietnamese claim is, a, is more legitimate than theirs, or the Indonesian or the, 
for the Philippines, they, they, they say we must be negotiated and understood. So that's number one. That's the legal side and extremely vague and complicated. The other side, I think, is much more straightforward. And that is that they see the, the South China Sea as well as the Eastern Sea, particularly the South China Sea, as now some place that can be used to attack China. You see, for 2,000 years, the Chinese had no enemies coming from the sea. They never had a single enemy that threatened China. In the 19th century, for the first time, enemy that came by sea, led by the British in the two opium wars, led up to the fall of Beijing, to burning of the summer palace and all that. And then finally ending up with the Pago Lianjing at the end of the boxes. For those two few decades, it was clear that ships bearing the enemy can now attack China. China's security in the past has always been about the land. They never had a security problem at sea. Now they recognize that you can be attacked by sea and you can be very seriously threatened by sea. The whole regime nearly was almost completely destroyed. So they see the East China Sea and the South China Sea as their inner waters to, for the defense and security of China. Well, how, whether we believe them or not, there are lots of people who doubt this. What they, what they say, I do not know. But all I know is that in their own minds, it is very clear. This is a very threatening area. It, it is the sea, the enemy can come from the sea and attack China, and China is vulnerable. And for the first time since the Zhenghe, 600 years, for the first time, they have seriously de 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 uh, developed a naval capacity to protect their, their coast from the enemy. Only started seriously in the 1990s, frankly. Until the 1990s, the Chinese didn't have any money to develop a navy. It's only since 1990, about the turn of the century, that they really started. So they've only got about 20 years or 20, 30 years to, to, to build a navy. Nothing compared to the kind of naval power that the Anglo-American heritage of 200, 300 years have built up. Nothing at all. But capacity to defend, I think they have the capacity. They're beginning to have the capacity to defend that is the coast of the China and South China Sea. To them, South China Sea is their is their back door. They they're not the South China Sea is not apart from them. They are actually part of the South China Sea. Their coastline is about maybe up to a third, one to about one third of the coastline is the Chinese coastline. If you include Taiwan, of course, this is a, this is another issue. If you include Taiwan, definitely about a third of the coastline of South China Sea is is actually Chinese territory, land territory. So they, 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 they see their claim as being quite natural and justified. And the legal position is not as clear cut as some of us might like to believe. Okay, we have about four minutes left and five outstanding questions. So I don't think we will be able to cover them all, but let's try to cover as many as we can. Um, I will now ask you a question on something completely different on technology. Um, this is a question from James, and the question is about whether the surveillance technologies will now change the nature of China's pursuit of a strong state. And he also wants it to have your views on whether technology had made a basic change uh, previously in history, for example, in enabling the Qin uh, kingdoms to play a role in building a strong and powerful unified empire. Technology is a, is a, is a two-way two sword. I mean, you can, you can use it to expand your power, but it can also be used by others to expand their power. So it's a question of how you handle it, how much of the technology is actually within your own control, how much of it depends on other people. At the moment, China, I think, is still very dependent on other people for their highest you know, technological developments. So they're still at a, at a growing up stage. But I think they're very much more powerful than ever before. And this is the part that I think is probably what troubles everybody. And that is the speed at which China gained so much control over their own manufacturing world, the world of uh, technology, science and technology, the capacity to learn so fast from the most advanced countries in the world in the last 40, 50 years. That is actually quite incredible. Of course, you can say other people have done it before, but other people have done it before at a different pace, but the whole world was much slower. The whole world is now so fast moving in the last 30, 40 years, and 
the Chinese have not only kept up with the pace, they've actually in, in some ways outpaced those who were ahead of them before. And this is frightening to a lot of people. They've never seen a country like that and not a small country or clever, a group of very clever people in a small country, relatively small country like Korea, South Korea or something like, because they're, they're small. This is a big country and this big country can acquire all these skills and technology and, and the kind of advances that they have made in the last 20, 30 years so rapidly. It is frightening. And I, I fully understand why not only the neighbors, the small neighbors, but even the United States feel threatened by this. This is very hard to understand because America is not being threatened by China. It's American hegemony in, in Asia that is threatened by China. And, uh, and if the Americans admit that, it's a hegemony they're trying to protect. Not, 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 they're not defending China, the United States against China. They're defending their capacity to be totally dominant in the sea, especially the sea, the whole Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. That is being challenged by the Chinese. And looking at what the Chinese are capable of in the last 20, 30 years, I think there are reasons why people are very concerned and very nervous. Well, um, the last round, I'm afraid afraid that there will be some questions that I will not be able to put to you. Um, there are two questions about pogroms, which I think are related. They're raised by um, Lisbeth and Christine. The question essentially is about how China may change the way how we look at progress. You talk about Karl Marx as one of the, uh, they gave the idea of uh, progress. Um, one of them would like to know, for example, that in the West, the idea of progress has changed particularly as a result of the Second World War and genocide. And is that going to have a similar kind of effect on China and how it thinks about it? And the second question that being put in parallel is, what about progress in terms of making uh, development sustainable? Would China perhaps look at its Taoist traditions to come up with an idea of progress that will contribute to a sustainable developing world? At this stage, I don't think the Chinese are doing enough thinking about that. I think at this stage, they are still excited by the idea of acquiring the obvious mastery of technology that is, pro that is measurable as progress. It's all measurable. They learned all that from the West, incidentally. They were never like that before. They learned all that, they mastered it. And of course, in, 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 a, in a strange sort of way, it is precisely because they learn so well from the West that they have done so well. And that the, the willingness now to learn from the West has been un, 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 unprecedented. They've never been so willing to learn from the outside world as they have been in the last 100 years. And the Chinese people, once they start to take something seriously and learn, they have uh, this, this amazing capacity to integrate it with themselves. That they're so excited by it, I think they have to, they have to be en encouraged to start thinking about what are the consequences of this if you carry on like that. I have noted earlier on that they're feeling, they're feeling it in within China where the pollution is so serious and what they can see is that they're getting sick. Their people are getting sick, their children, their grandchildren, all are going to be affected by this. They, it does worry them. And do, they do have in, the, in, the, in their own DNA, so to speak, the desire for the peaceful, harmonious, harmony with nature kind of life which is romanticized in Chinese poetry, literature, and the Taoist philosophy and so on. They do have that, but it is not in the forefront of their minds at the moment. Secondly, even more serious to my mind, they have basically undermined the Confucian family system and the kind of uh, mor morality that the Confucians emphasized in the past are no longer significant to the young generation today. They, they know about it, uh, they, they may say nice things about it. They pay lip service to it, perhaps. Some of the philosophers and serious thinkers still do, but the impact on the society as a whole is very limited. What they're caught by, and this is what is, I think, frightening to other people, the most interesting the thing that most impressed them about Western progress has been material progress. It's the Faustian uh, kind of bargain that the West made, as it were, in the past, in the 18th century, which have caught Caught, they caught that fever and they're now developing. So the sustainable development part is something that 
I believe they will ha they will have to they ha will have to face. In fact, already they have already to have to think about aging before they get rich. Now, these are genuine problems. They have to think about restructuring the economy, not as export oriented as in the past of the last forty years. It's not that's what's going, not going to continue because the more successful they are, and if the rest of the world doesn't accept that anymore, they cannot follow that model. Already they are now trying to restructure the, the, the economic model. I'm not sure they know exactly what to do yet, but they are thinking very hard. And the fact that they are doing so, I think cannot be denied, but whether they can find the answer as quickly as they found uh, all the other things, I'm not so sure. But I'm pretty certain that ultimately they will learn everything about the West. They will actually in the end adopt all the things that have made the world what it is today. They have reservations, those reservations are gradually, as they see those reservations, less and less threatening to themselves, I think they will let it, where they will, they will accept that. Well, thank you very much, Gangwu, Professor Wang, for an absolutely fantastic session. I regrettably have been defeated by the clock and must apologize to the others who have raised questions that I have not been able to fit them in. Before I draw this completely to a close, please allow me to share with you a fantastic piece of news. The speaker today, our guest of honor, Professor Gang Wu Wang, has very, very recently been um, awarded the Tang Prize in Sinology, which will formally be awarded to him in Taipei in September. And this is a prize that was created as a parallel to the Nobel Prizes, and one which had a special prize for Sinology. So I think it's an absolutely fitting and wonderful tribute to a fantastic scholar who have just shared his insight with us. Congratulations, Gang Wu. Thank you, thank you. And secondly, just to remind everyone of you that if you are interested in getting hold of a copy of the book, you should be able to find a discount link or code from the chat box or from the web page at the SOAS China Institute advertising this particular event. And with that note, let me thank, thank you all for your patience and for your participation. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.